Hey, thanks for joining me here. My name is Michael Swank. I'm here inside of our gallery studios in Mexico City, Mexico. We are in Colonial Juarez, a central location right next to El Centro and within walking distance of La Roma, Condesa, Polanco, y of course, El Centro. So we have all the major cultural institutions here and we have a many, 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 many art fairs during Semana de Arte uh, in February. So we hope that we're gonna see you here again soon inside the gallery, but we've created this podcast to connect you to the artists that we work with so that you can understand better the themes, the context, materials and processes and what it means to be an artist and why we do the things that we do. So I hope that you find our podcast informative, entertaining, and that you want to subscribe to us. Keep in mind also that we have a companion publication, Bureau of Queer Art, which you can purchase through our website at artgallerystudios.com. Check it out there. I hope that you'll purchase that so that you can see all the images with the production as well as get extra content related to what we do here at Art Gallery Studios. If you're an artist and you're interested in participating, please, please, please go to Art Gallery Studio. Check us out. Click the apply button and we'll see you soon. So um, Stephen, tell me a little bit about your work. I, I gotta say, I've never, I've never had a submission that was glass art. Um, and I've never seen glass art done this specific way that you're doing it. I grew up in Indiana and I remember that there were glass artists who would do like little trinket things and you know, maybe um, sell at the state fair or something like that. But they never, they were never like, uh, like conceptually fine art. They were never trying to make it fine art. Um, so I'm really curious about how you came into the media of glass and like what the significance of that is for you too. Well, I dove into art making after 9-11. I had a 33 year career in hospitality. Uh, working for the Disney company and various different hotels. And after 9-11, I kind of took that moment to say, this is your sign and go do the thing that you've always wanted to do. But because I'm a child of the 70s and 80s, art was never something that was going to be, you know, supported by any of my family members in that respect. So it was like, you have to get a job doing something real. So I went back to school and I started to, I knew I wanted to work in three dimensions. I knew I wanted to be a sculptor. And through that process, I started sculpting in aluminum and then in bronze and then eventually in into cast iron. And I loved the process of thinking, you know, in three dimensions, you know, you have a, a positive, you make a mold, you exit the mold, create the thing. But the end result was creating these things that were progressively darker and heavier and kind of lifeless, especially when we got to cast iron. And right. so I then, took a, a step away from that and I said I wanted to sculpt and I started doing paper and fabric and finally uh, I went to a graduate exhibition at the Rochester Institute of Technology and I saw glass being manipulated as a sculptural material and I this is like my aha moment I said okay I need to learn how to do this so I applied to grad school and in my vacation letter I said I have no glass experience and I don't care if this takes me five years, seven years. I don't, I have to do this. Uh, and P.S., I'm going to apply next year if I don't get in and continually until I actually do this. Um, and they said, no, 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 you'll need to do an additional year, but based on your, your resume and your, your history, your portfolio. And so that's where I started. Um, the technique I use is called flame working. And so, or the traditional term is called lamp working. And that uh, utilizes a series of different torches these torches are driven by propane and oxygen. And because I use um, borosilicate glass, you know this glass is Pyrex, but mm -hmm. uh, it takes a, a higher temperature to melt it. So this torch produces uh, a flame temperature of about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 2,208 degrees Celsius. And that is a temperature that you need to melt um, borosilicate or Pyrex. Uh, it's, it's all Pyrex done. Pyrex more durable than traditional glass? Is that the reason to use it with your structures? I, yes, um, you're right on, on point with regard to its durability. I use it because it is a material that you can immediately heat, shape, manipulate, and then leave it without the necessity to slowly warm the product up 
uh, eat it, and then immediately put it in a kiln and anneal it. So there's this uh, immediacy to working with it, um, okay. which uh, allows you to do that. And if you think about it, it's the same um, material that all of the containers in chemistry class, you know, uh -huh. the beakers and the test tubes. And so you would stick that right into a flame to boil your acid or whatever caustic solution, right? Um, and it's durable, much more durable, because again, it held all those experiments that we were right. mixing and generating. So there's a durability. It also, the primary reason is it, because it resists thermal shock. Huh, so okay. it can be heated quickly, manipulated, pulled extremely thin, and it still remains as strong as it did when it was in original form. So even though it's super fine, it's incredibly right. strong. Yeah, I mean, I looked at your works and your portfolio and what you had submitted, and I was just like, I, I, I it's nice to know what the material is, because I was thinking, how is it possible that this stays together? Because you have these structures that are, I mean, they look like sketches. It, it, I mean, it literally looks like you sketched on a pad of paper, and then it was just three-dimensional. Uh, well, I thank you because you're right on task again or right on point. And that's the whole thing. It's like I look at my experience and members of the LGBTQ plus community and I see how we're perceived in the world, right? We are constantly bullied. We are perceived as these fragile, these delicate, these very, uh, I, I, I think you know where I'm going. I'm lacking words. Right. Um, well, feminine. Uh, so there's a it's a gender role. It's a it's a um, it's a discrimination against the female and the ideal and the material itself and the delicacy at which you have created these sculptures has a femininity to it that only a queer artist can bring to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the other part too for me utilizing and choosing this type of glass to use is because it's just like the community. We may appear that way from the outside, oh, inside, we are constantly surviving. We are constant, throw any barrier in front of us. And I think in, I put a quick chronology about the amount of time that I've been on the planet and how much we've all been legislated against. And yet we still rise, we still find a way to become, you know, productive and effective. And we do so with this tongue in cheek sense of humor, but there right. is a vitality, you know, an inner strength that is completely inherent to us. Um, to any of us, we are always right. surviving. And it is the same. This material looks delicate and it looks fragile. And it looks like if you breathe on it and it's intended to look that way, but inherently it is the strongest type of glass that we can sculpt with. And that right. is exactly why I parallel the two. This idea of fragility, impermanence, breakability, that's all we get as gay people. Oh no, you, you're not strong. There's no way. Oh, you're, you're, I mean, let's use the terms, fairy, right? Faggot, right? right wrong we're still here right and and we will always be here be and that is why i parallel it and i intentionally create the structure and probably the best ideas or examples of that are when the work is sandblasted right to these frosted What's images what so sandblasting so sandblasting is a it's a mechanical uh, process essentially you before you weld steel together you sandblast it you abrade the surface in my case, I use 45 pounds of air pressure and a man-made sand called silica carbide. And it literally, it will remove rust from steel before you weld it. It'll remove paint from the surface of anything. When you sandblast glass, it goes from a shiny and transparent surface to this frosted opaque surface. Okay. Yeah. And so here again, when we look about time and pressure and abrasion over time, mm -hmm that is our community right and yet we withstand all of it and as a result i tend to believe we come the work becomes more beautiful as we do right as, as we rise to that Good. situation there is a a parallel and so that is uniquely why and in the transparent works it's the same these concepts in my mind are exactly that it's a little tongue-in-cheek it's a little cliche to say but these are transparent right right all of us have gone through something in our in our younger life that was not good, right? Our, all of our upbringings, or I shouldn't say all, the majority of people in our community have had horrible, horrible. That to me is transparent, right? These concepts are created out of materials that are transparent, right? The odd thing about them is though, even though they're see-through and transparent, they still leave shadows, so.
that's a oh, wow that's a very that's a very beautiful metaphor yeah um because it because it does also it also it also me means that you exist in in a form in which the world or the light source can create that shadow so even though we exist in community invisibly at times as a method of protecting ourselves mm -hmm. um you know we still cast a shadow <laughs> so yeah so exactly there is an existential component to the work as well but it is and it you know the work for me the evolution has started i mean glass working is it is, it is part of the craft history, craft with a capital C, like fine workmanship in, in metal or steel or wood or uh, ceramics. It is one of those American crafts that we've kind of really pushed through the, the glass, the studio glass movement from 1974 to about 1996, where there's this massive movement taking glass from a functional product of utilitarian use cups bowls right and in, right. you starting to utilize it into this method of creating work it will never be part of quote unquote fine art with a capital f for fine art because it's always a craft and so right. what i'm doing in this aspect is i'm honoring my craft tradition wholly i'm standing fully in that but i'm also taking those components of fine art which i've learned through my undergrad and graduate degree to say no no we can still imbue concept and meaning utilizing this material even though it is a craft if you will I'm, I'm right i'm crossing the borders between fine art where you have a concept you realize that concept and then you bring it into three-dimensional form whether that's painting or photography sculpture whatever it is but this is a craft right so we're going to own that because that's what it is but we're still right. going to borrow from those traditions and move it a little cl closer to the center to say Mm -hmm. Is it art? Is it craft? Is it art? Is it craft? It still has concept. It still has meaning and it has still been, in, it has been intentionally designed to do those things and to bring those right. thoughts forward. So I'm And what is the response? Like how, what are the kinds of responses that you get? Because the art world is very, can be very myopic yes. um, and, and, uh, and exclusionary as well. So I look on your website and I see you have a, you have tons of upcoming exhibition events and things. Um, yeah. So clearly there's a, people are recognizing what you're doing. I'm sure there's two sides to that coin as well. <laughs> there are. Um, so for example, I do, I just finished in May um, the Smithsonian show, right? And so that was the very first time I applied for it. I was very, very happy to, to be a participant there. And so it was really wildly, um, received. Um, my work was purchased by uh, curators uh, throughout the country, but also um, a curator who works for the Museum of Modern Art in Kuwait. She actually bought two pieces for herself. She, full disclosure, she's not buying from for that museum, Brilliant. but she bought it for herself. So it was, it was interesting. It was great. But I've also had the other side of that to say, mm, you're straight out of the gate. Nope. Glass is a craft. You are not a fine art. Sorry. Right. And so, but I don't, I don't get caught up in that. And like my, the m overwhelming response that I, I usually get is usually, I've never seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about this. Or yeah. I enjoy greatly the way in which you put concept into the work or the, I, I also get Thank you for, for what you've written about the piece. This helps me understand. And now I see exactly. And then people are, are constantly, how do you do this? This is black. How do you do this? And do you believe that that, uh, that element of the question, how do you do this? This is black. Do you take on that responsibility to educate people or do you leave it to them to discover? No, I, 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 I tell people exactly. I have no problem telling people about the way in which I do things. I mean, there are some artists out there who are always trying to, you know, copy and replicate, but for the most part, I, I mean, I jokingly say, I'll tell you exactly how I do it because I don't think you're going home to your garage and, and firing up a 4,000 degree torch, you're gonna steal my idea, so like go. But if you are, I think the ideas are pretty blatant. So if you start, you know, 
if you are a glass artist and a flame worker and you do see this, you know, are you going to really dive in? Because then you got to be, you got to be a gay flame worker. And I think there might be seven right. in the world. So, and I have all of them in my phone and contacts. So I'm like, I don't think you're, but if you are, then okay. It's got to be. It would be a, it would be a great show with the seven uh, gay uh, flame workers and just call it flamer. You know? Yes. <laughs> President. I, I, like, I love this idea because it's like, you're going from these, in a very masculine, very modernist, art form of working in sculpture and steel and all these other materials and then here you are with a 4,000 degree torch working with this very delicate material that has a has a you know like a more feminine perception to it I mean that's a very um and you're spot on because it is it is the epicenter of toxic masculinity working in the the glass world it is they self-proclaim call themselves the truck drivers of the art world (laughs) <laughs> it's true. They they love this whole grind about masculinity and right. dude and you know the whole toxic culture. And so here comes me. I'm like, and <laughs> we're gonna add this to the sentence. It's not finished until <laughs> right, comma, however. <laughs> here. Right. Yeah. So I mean, and I don't I find that it's it's great. Usually I'm I'm extremely accepted. Um as soon as you remind them that this is how we're gonna play the game. And right, I think there's right. there's something that helps being an older person among 20, 30, and 40 year olds that says, this is how we're well, gonna what, behave. Well, I am curious about that idea about like the cross-generational. Um, I do find that there's a, I mean, there's this idea about like, you know, emerging artists are always going to be under 30. Um, you know, you started your career after many years and then, completely different career Mm -hmm. um obviously you've been in it now for a a fair amount of time so you're no longer an emerging artist but I mean can you speak a little bit to the sort of ageism of working in this material and how what you what you feel your role is and do you work with within the queer community are you working to try to develop other artists in this media too or well I would love to if there was a population that identified themselves. Like I say, I know of about six or seven different artists in the entire glass industry. Now, that's the furnace working industry, which is the traditional, you know, when you think about glass blowing, but that there's casting glass, there's cold working, Mm -hmm. uh, similar to um, Baccarat or Swarovski, where they're cutting crystal into, you know, and mineral. So throughout all of it, I would love the opportunity to work with other individuals. And, you know, I just recently left the Corning Museum of Glass after many years working there, um, where I taught all levels, all age groups, Mm -hmm. um, senior citizens down to beginners at 14, 15 years old, um, in weekend classes, week-long classes, um, 10-week classes. Uh, I also managed the Artist in Residence program there. So there was a huge interaction. So based on that role, I have very frequently felt um, the necessity to assist others or be a teacher or help others. And, and that has been throughout the, um, throughout my time at Corning, developing my staff or talking to other individuals, it's, it's frequently been the role I've adopted to be, right, come along, we're moving forward because we're not staying here, right? So right. let's go, let's learn, let's, let's move it and work forward, so. Yeah. And these roles, are you are you out in those roles? I mean, I don't know what the culture is in Syracuse, yeah. and um, Absolutely. you know, it, I, I think being out is a very complex thing. So I don't place any judgment on that because it's uh, sometimes we're within context where it's just not safe to, mm-hmm. to be like, you know, completely out, or we have to modify pronouns and things to um, protect ourselves um in the in the world too so i'm i'm sitting here looking at your at your work and and this this bird's nest um that is like these delicate leaves that are all wrapped around each other how long how long does it take to create something like this well from concept this is um this is a piece called sanctum and those are actually feathers interwoven into the Um, and if you look in the next detail photo, you'll be able to see this a little better. Um, this is months of work. Uh, each one of those feathers is individually made. 
Um, the nest is individually made by itself. So heating glass rods, pulling them, uh, um, shaping them, fusing and, and welding them together, adding all of the feathers intricately wow. into them. And then to give it this patina, this is the, the end result called sandblasting. So right. it, it takes um, several weeks to create the, the piece itself. And then at the end of it, you put it into the sandblaster and you pummel it with 45 pounds of air pressure and silica carbide. And that takes it from a very shiny surface into this frosted delicate surface. And that's critical to this piece. Sanctum talks a lot about, you know, in this concept of nest being a home, right? Mm -hmm. And feathers in the natural world, as I see them, they do, they have two major functions. The first is protection, which is a huge right. thing. So they, they're waterproofing and they're insulating like goose down, right? But then the other thing they do is they're critical in the, in the concept of, of flight, mm -hmm. right? Lift, they provide lift. And so I utilize them many times. You'll see them if they're curved like so, uh, they're protecting. If they're curved like so, it's indication of lift or hope. And so this, I call it sanctum because it's this idea of home, protected, insulated, hope, joyful, you know, and it speaks a lot to the current time that we're in where we talk about is what is our future going to look like, you know, right. and what I'm, the message it sends is no, no, there is always a place for us. There are always be a place where you will be home and you will be protected, whether that's in community or, or if it is within your, your, your own personal mindset, but remember you're, you're cradled, you're, you're held. You know, so this is a, I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful metaphor. It's also just as an object, these are absolutely gorgeous. Um, I, and, I, I'm intrigued by the variety. Um, I, I love these structures that are like houses and ladders that you have as well. Um, what it, is there a metaphor with the with home that you're you're working towards here? Because um, I see the same. It's a bird nest, but it's also you know a, a literal shape of a home. Like what any if you ask a six year old to draw a home, they're going to draw a box with a triangle on top. So I'm right on again. I'm, I'm just hitting. I'm at 100 percent today. You are. Well, that's it. Um, this comes. This piece here that you're looking at right now on the screen that was part of my thesis exhibit um, at RIT, the Rochester Institute of Technology, and it was, I was utilizing nests very much in my understanding as homes, part of the natural world to convey this concept of home, like where many of us in the, in the queer community start, right? That's where we're either super protected or sometimes we're not, right? But it's, it's, it's always this place of where am I? Who am I? What is my identity? How is my, it's this nurturing place. It's this place of safety, right? And so if we, we look at it as that, I just looked at it as a nest saying, of course, everyone understand it. But my, one of my professors, um, Michael Rogers basically said, you need to do a better job of tying that concept together and be as literal as you can, be as, as economical in the thought process. And so I just stuck this literal house, this stick figure that anyone would recognize as a house to tie it in that says, when you see nest, nest equates to home, mm -hmm. right? So now it becomes inseparable. And if you move forward, you'll see some, like there's a piece called Adolescence where this nest home structure is sitting on ladders this is, um, this is social wow. disorder, right? And it has a root structure on the bottom. But if you go to the next one, I think the next in the series might be two more. No, keep going. There. Oh, wow. This is called, ad yeah. <laughs> this is adolescent. Because those ladders, the whole, the whole stilts, if you will, those are indic indicative of movement, right? Up or down right? One uses a ladder to move. If you lay a ladder sideways, it becomes a railroad track, right? right? So I use ladders constantly to understand movement. And this is on these ladders that look like it cannot support itself. Even if you were, if they were made out of steel, those stilts just look precariously unstable. And that's right. intentionally because that was my adolescence. But how, it, does, how, does it, how does it actually stay? Like it, just, it's, I look at it and it doesn't, it, I just, I'm terrified. Like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Cause that's how I was during my adolescence. 
It conveys right. that meaning. On the right-hand side, you'll see it. Uh, there are three small ladders that are touching the, the surface, and those are sitting okay. on pin points. They've been pulled okay. to the to a pinpoint, and it structurally it has an epicenter. The house tilts this way. The next connection point is in the ladder brace, and that distributes the weight onto those three points. Wow. And this thing is 42 inches tall. And so when you wow. put it in a gallery, it's over a yardstick high. And so people come up to it immediately and they and then you can see them, they back away. Of course. But it is, it is that it's the whole intention of that concept of how do you take something? And here again, as economical as I can make that point to say, how do I, how do I bring someone's feeling about insecurity, about I, I, I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I don't want to be near this, I don't, I don't this, is, this is unstable, this will break, this will collapse. The weight of that nest shouldn't be supported by that one leg, which is off center, right. the whole thing is going to fall over. Those were, I, and I tend to believe that those are many things that our, our community goes through during adolescence. This idea that home is safety was not my experience, as many people, it, right? Home is, is, a, is a place of tranquility and no, it isn't. But in this process to say, you don't stay here, right? You move. You well, move. I would say that this adolescence can also be transported to anyone conceptually who is coming out of the closet at any point in their life. Um, you know, somebody who maybe is married for 30 years and then comes out of the closet is exactly where the adolescent is. Um, yeah, you know, um, very much so. It's it's a very do they break? Do you, do you break things? I don't. <laughs> I did have one when this, <laughs> when this was exhibited in Washington D.C. I had a gallery owner, and I I will generally install them uh, just so that I don't put anybody through the process of having to touch them because people would just lose their mind. But the gallery owner called me and she said. <laughs> I know that you told me that there is a specific leg that this thing has to sit on and the other one won't allow it to stand. It sits on the other leg and I have to show <laughs> you something because we're terrified. Someone, some visitor, some guest to the museum moved it to stand oh. on both legs <laughs> and they sent me the photo and they're like, we want to return it, but we don't know which one. I was like, okay, let's just do a, a FaceTime call. And so, wow. You know, so it's yeah. interesting that somebody would be that brave as well. <laughs> That's what I said. Who who would touch it? Like, I just don't understand. Like, but yeah, yeah. that was so. But no, they I they're engineered and designed for um, that strength of the material. There again, that that speaks to the material and the material. Well, I have, I, it does make me feel better because I looked at it and I said, "There's no way that I would ever be able to exhibit in the gallery here because we." You know, we have a we have a metro line underneath us. There's a four lane road over here. There's, I mean, and there's earthquakes here like all the time. So uh, everything here has to be stabilized, and you know, putty has to be put behind things to make sure that it doesn't move. And it still moves. It all moves. <laughs> like every Saturday before I open the gallery, I'm like walking around, like re leveling everything. <laughs> and I, I, so I, I looked at this and I was like. I don't even know. I don't even know if it's possible, but it does make it does make me feel more confident. I mean, do you often have people who are afraid to buy things with the bat, or um, they require that explanation? Or yeah, I mean, I have sold this piece four times, and each time uh, it has we've made modifications to the size and shape um, mm -hmm. so that there are specific locations for it. Um, okay. Generally, two of the times it was, there was a um, plexiglass um, dome put over the top of it or box put over it. And then two of the times it was, uh, there were special niches that were created in the, one in a building, a corporate building, and then one in, in a home. Okay, okay. I was gonna ask that as a question about the glass domes because um, I'm curious how that, works with your metaphor and your conceptual ideals as well because uh, it does give a sense of protection to it for obviously for display and longevity um, but also seeing this outside of a dome and being vulnerable is a completely different experience 
Right. So when you see works underneath the cloches or in the domes, that type goes back to this idea of the Victorians who would, um, they would put samples, uh, whether they would be plant material or other items underneath a dome so that it could be studied, right? There's this whole um, body of work by the Blaschkas, a father and son team um, who were glass artists, but they made these replicas um, in, and because of this necessity during um, different types of study, most, material, most particularly in the Victorian era, when you would put something under a dome to preserve it from the air so that you could study the, the makeup of the botany or the muscular structure of the dissected rabbit or frog, right? If you're studying medicine. So there is this, A, this protectin, but also this ability to analyze and study. Um, okay. So it, it serves not so much as, oh, this is a sacred object, but we're examining this. So, you know, we're taking a page from the Victorian era and saying, this is how we used to study things. In other words, this is how we used to look closely. This is how we used to investigate. This is how we used to, you know, and it provides that when you see it immediately, you would then say, oh, this is something I should study. I should pay attention. It's been put here so that people can go and study it and they can look closely. So it's, the intention is to look closely, which to investigate the concept, right? I just, you imagine, uh, you know, parents with children, like slowly pushing the child away to yeah. <laughs> protect the object <laughs> integrity. Yeah. yeah, We're looking at this uh, 2022 blown Latino hanging ornament. This is, this, this is like, to me is very, to, to, uh, 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 to, I, Sorry, Tuhuli, Tuhuli, Tuhuli. Right, thank you. Right. I'm trying to say it in Spanish, and it's not a Spanish name. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dale is. I don't think. I don't know what his nationality is. Anyway, um, yeah, this is simply a demonstration of what the material can actually do. The latticino is the twisted cane that you see in axis north, south, east, or west. It's the main axis, and that is. Um, that's a nod to the Venetian history of flameworking. I was, uh, when I was in Corning, I served for as the uh, teaching assistant for many of the Venetians when they would come and take classes or teach classes. Um, and so one of the, the preeminent one is uh, Emilio Santini. And Emilio uh, taught me how to correctly make this twisted cane. He's sixth generation Ven uh, Venetian. Um, wow. And so did this you, is. Did you travel there to to work with him directly, or was he? He would come to Corning, New York, to the museum and teach a, a week long class. And because I was there, um, he I would be his assistant. So when he he would come to to, to New York, um, that would be the, the way I would work. And I mean, we, it's just, it's stunningly light. It just has this air quality to it that looks. It, it's a snowflake. It's a you know raindrop. <laughs> Yeah, and the center is, is actually blown in hollow. So all okay. of this is, an, again, a testament to the strength of the material because it would have this significant amount of weight in the bottom and the sides and the top, and yet the bubble in the center is about as thick as your hair. So it's, it's super thin, and yet it's super strong. And it allows you to pull and create all this fine detail where most, I mean, you can't do that with clay. You can't do that with steel. You can't, I suppose you could do it with fiber but um, it's, it's really unique to what the material can do. So it's, it's a testament. It's super exciting. I, I'm, as I like look through it too, I, I, you know, I grew up in Indiana and um, I do remember um, there being flame workers who would work on things, but it was always like, it was just craft sort of thing. And they were like tiny objects and, you know, you would buy them for your grandmother, um, you know, so it's, it, it's really, it's a beautiful thing to see them, see this, this technique and material and a material transformed into a narrative. Um, and I, I, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm fascinated by these. I, I, like, I want to, I want to see a room full of them. You know, I want to see how the light responds to it. I want to see, you know, um, uh, do you ever work with, uh, well, the other one had a little bit more color to it. A lot of these are, are clear 
for frosted, as you as you noted too. So, um, most, do you work with? Most, go ahead. I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry. Do you work with color a lot, or? I I have a retail line. That I do work primarily in color, um, which is fine. It's a production line. Many artists have both. This uh, this area is museum quality. Um, the the retail line is is all color, but in the primarily the work that's conceptual, it's clear or it's sandblasted. Um, right. And it goes back to that whole transparency, that concept of, you know, aligning these, this, yeah, this is another piece, the memory baskets. Um, oh, is these trees, these trees make me feel very hopeful. Um, I mean, there's the idea to me also that it's, you know, like a, like an ice storm has come through and you see the delicacy of the way the ice grips to the tree, but the, obviously the tree doesn't exist here. Um, so there's like this, this whole fragility to it, but it's, it's an environment um, with these ladders emerging up as well and everything. And um, there's a lot of, in all your work, I see a lot of upward movement, a lot of positivity. Where does the positivity come from you? You, you speak about this ideal of the queer experience and sort of the kind of the, you know, the difficulty of childhood, the tragedy of acceptance and non-acceptance, but where does your hope come from? Well, there is no alternative but, right? You, you, you again, I say this constantly, I say it to my students all the time, moving forward, because we're not staying here. Right. And that is my mantra in life. So like the trees, when I was, uh, in my youth, I was, I, I was raised on a cattle farm in upstate New York. And it was not uh, an acceptable situation at all to be a member of the queer community. And so the trees became, the forest became my, my safe space and I would escape. Um, and literally the, the latter situation comes from this idea and this comprehension that trees are, are the great connectors. They connect the celestial and the terrestrial. They're the bridge in between both. And they were a place for me like, I could climb and be unseen, right, mm -hmm. the way. Or if I ran far enough and fast enough, I could get lost in, in the depth of that forest where people who were bullying me, you know, wouldn't go any longer. And so when I was there and I spent a lot of time in those forests, I right. began to mention. And so this idea of moving, and trees do this, right? They move sap and they move carbon dioxide up and down and, and there's this exchange and there's this constant understanding. And so they're always ladders for me. They're always conveyors of movement. Um, they always have been, whether it's my physical movement up and down or within, or again, by paying attention, seeing that they were the homes to incredible amounts of species and that they they did have this ability to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide, or they did have this enormous potential growth in the in spring where they just exploded, right, mm -hmm. into, into life. And so I see them very much as, as ladders. And so this is a concept that's evolving because the next one will be hanging and the ladder is gonna suspend and the root system will fall. So that's the next evolution of that ladder tree. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm curious if you're moving in a specific direction now, or if you feel drawn towards a specific direction in the work that you're gonna be creating in the future. Uh, two things, as I get older, like the next image you see is memory baskets. And so mm -hmm. I, I am fearful, like I create these because this, I used to be that person who remembered everything, all, you know, phone numbers when we used to remember right. phone numbers and birthdays and addresses. And so my memory used to be very tight knit container. And now um, as more and more wisdom comes to my head. Right? <laughs> Brushing away the white hair. <laughs> that is the wisdom, right? right? The weave has opened up in that container and it's weathered. I mean, it's still there but it's not as strong as it used to be. And it's been beaten up and just like the drift with the handle, right? The container, it, it gets there. So I, I'm fearful that um, there that people will not remember. And I say this because I like, I'm frequently reminded of my friends who have children who are now dating and, and um, 
they'll say, oh, you know, oh, they're going to have a baby. And I'm like, oh, great. Are they married? No, but they're going to, I'm like, oh, this is an unplanned. Great. And immediately in my head, when I go back to age 20, 22, 23, that was a death sentence. Right. Yeah. That, that, that was something, if you, if you had unprotected sex, you, you, I remember those period from 1989 to 92, where I buried 12 friends per year. Right. Yeah. And so I'm like, part of this is, do you not remember? And they don't. They don't. If you may ask, ask you, them, may I ask you how old you are? I'm 56. Okay. I'm 53. So I came out in 87. And, and then uh, I went through that period up, up to about 94, where it just felt like you'd make a friend and they died. Um, you know, and so there was this constant cycle of people coming through. And um, I was working in an aged charity thrift store in Seattle. And there were home services and all these elements to um, what the thrift store supported. And I remember one day we received a truckload of items from somebody who had just passed away. And that person, as their last thing that they did, was they labeled every single object with their name because they did not want it to be forgotten that these things belong to someone um, mm. who died of AIDS. Um, yeah. So uh, when I look at these memory baskets, it, you know, it reminds me of neurons. It reminds me of you know, like all these connections, but the thickness of them is changed in this one. Um, they, the sculptural form feels it doesn't feel as light as some of the other ones. Right, yeah. They're, they're much more dense. They're much more involved. They're, they're actually, this is not a great photo because you don't actually get to see inside of them either. But the wall of the basket, if you will, is about an inch and a half to two inches and it is completely woven. The right. rods come together and move in and out. But it's this idea too that, you know, if you say the words act up, people don't know what that right. means. Young gay people don't know, but I'm like, and or you'll get the oh, is that was the AIDS liberation or the, the the gay liberation? I'm like, no, 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 no. It was the coalition. It's a, thing. It's a much yeah. different thing. It was like we had finally been so fed up with Reagan's inactivity that we took it upon ourselves to do research. We demanded, right? And right, they want to talk about well, and also that movement was very, very. It was a it was a, uh, mm, sorry, uh, it was an artistic movement. It was a visual movement. It, it took the queer sensibility and it crafted it in a way that created a visibility that was beautiful and nonviolent, um, which I think is something that people have forgotten about this ideal of like, Change, be, change has been made, everything can go, you can track all the progress of the queer community back to act up. Um, so, and, and aid um, in my mind, I mean, obviously there's a whole history around it and everything right. supporting it, but this was the visual artistic movement, a, a symbol of like the loss of the artistic community as well um, that exists today. I mean, you know, that, still it still influences everything i had a silence equals death t-shirt made here in mexico for an opening i had four or five years ago here and they forgot the equal symbol so it just said silencio muerto <laughs> pink triangle and i i still wore it because i just thought it was hilarious this idea right. that the equal the equal symbol is gone and that that it, you know that within the cultural interpretation and education yeah. levels and you know, that's great everything. but it is it is sort of a it is sort of a it's a memory um that i think a lot of people don't don't uh, recognize the connection to of course well mm -hmm. i i am i am deeply in love with your work Stephen. i it's just a it's a beautiful thing i was after i i was when i saw the application i was completely surprised 
And in the first moment, my first instinct was to disregard. Um, uh, Why? Because it was glass. Because it was glass. Okay. So I thought my first instinct was to see it as, oh, somebody, somebody submitted craft work and we're not really showing that here. And then I went in, uh, I, I always try to go beyond my first perception of things and honor the application. Um, so I, I dug in deeper and then when I saw it and uh, read what you had written about it, it, it was like, a, it really was like an explosion for me. It was like, wow, I need to know more. I need to understand this at a deeper level. And it, it's really beautiful. It's gorgeous. Thank you. I mean, um, so um, I, I hope that we get to work with you. Um, here in the gallery or in many different ways and things because I think that this narrative, the material, everything about it is just super exciting. It's just Thank very you. beautiful. Um, Thank you. That's that's really wonderful to hear. To, to And it's also interesting to hear the other part where, oh, it's glass, forget it, right? Not, well, I'm, I'm validating good, something that you, that you had said uh, yeah. and it, this, there, there is this battle between craft and fine art and I live in a culture that is uh, in Mexico that is very craft oriented like there's a, yeah. a deep history of artisanal um, you know uh, career based artisan uh, um, work here and definitely a cultural bias um, against okay. that transformation as well um, so and I work with a lot of young queer Mexican artists who um, you know, are doing sewing and um, taking these artisanal things and bringing them into the fine art realm as well. So, um, okay. so I'm a little embarrassed by my my initial perception. You know, I'm I'm admitting it because it's I think it's an important part of the discussion. You know, it's, it is. It's always good. You know, the thing that you know, if you apply as an artist to different shows, you can expect that you're not going to be accepted all the time. But the big question is sure. why. Why was I not? And so if you understand that, then it's, that's, that's an insight that is super valuable, you know? Well, it's, it's power. I mean, you know, knowledge is power. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you giving uh, your time to me today to um, do this exploration. And I hope that it brings um, more visibility and, um, and inspires uh, other people I'm inspired if I if I thought at any point I could handle a 4,000 you know, <laughs> plane towards I would 